And that brings me to today's topic, confronting implicit bias within ourselves. Um, we know we've all done this uh, about securing our own masks before helping others. We've either ignored the flight attendant safety instructions before liftoff, glazing over the advice they give us on using the oxygen masks. For those who might miss those critical instructions explaining why we always need to secure our own mask before helping others during an emergency, we know that we need to do that so that we're not too disoriented or weak to help anyone else. Similarly, implicit bias influences one's thoughts and actions very much like the allegory that, uh, that's been used by our presenter. Support professionals selflessly serve others without addressing our own needs first. And sometimes the lack of personal awareness of implicit bias can make our attempts to be helpful um, just the opposite, causing more harm rather than improving the situation. And so this concept of securing one's own mask can be applied to many topics in today's society, especially those related to structural barriers, racism. Researchers have found that the more we ignore and disguise our racial biases, the more likely we are to perpetuate them. During today's presentation, we will hear how structural racism is held up by both explicit and implicit biases. We will discover how structural racism is a system that we all inherited and why it is now, although we might not have had a big role in creating it, it's our responsibility to change it. And we will learn how to perform critical self-assessments of ourselves to identify some of our implicit biases. We hope that this discovery will help us and help others that you will be and, and that we will all be able to use these tools to dismantle <clears throat> systems of structural racism and to advance true and meaningful inclusion and equity within our workplaces, our organizations, and our life. I'm so honored to introduce today's presenter, Felicia Brooks Floyd is a founding member and president of the National Association of Professional and Peer Lactation Supporters of Color on Apple C. Felicia is a former USBC board member and a member of CRASH. And I can't say enough about how her guidance has improved and strengthened USBC's governance practices from making our nominations more transparent and uh, accountable to board processes to really making us look at how pernicious and invisible culture can be in creating barriers. So th through her work, through her crash, through her work on our crash committee, she's been invaluable in so many ways. Felicia is also a leader with the Florida Breastfeeding Coalition, an active member with the Florida Lactation Consultants Association. She's an IBCLC with degrees in public service and psychology and has worked for over a decade in community-based healthcare, ranging from healthcare to WIC-based community support. Currently, uh, Felicia works for um, <clears throat> a hospital health system overseeing the day-to-day -day operations of the lactation program of over four departments. And she also helps families to breastfeed in her private practice called Beyond Breastfeeding. Felicia was a member of the first food cohort at the Center for Social Inclusion and is a valuable member of um, USBC, continues to be a valuable member of USBC's leadership community. She was honored by the USBC with the inaugural Legacy Award in 2014. She wears so many hats. She's the creator of the social media and online community breastfeeding support group, Affection affectionately known as the Black Tourist, and empowers um, efforts to help increase breastfeeding rates in the African-American community. Felicia is a proud active duty Air Force military spouse and a grateful mother of three exclusive breastfed children. And with that, I'm gonna, gonna turn it over to Felicia. Welcome, Felicia. Thank you for that beautiful introduction, Kim Kenny. It's so wonderful to be 
in the spirit of um, my fellow um, USBC advocates, thank you for having Napplesey um, present to you today. Um, today, we're going to discuss um, securing your own mask before helping others, confronting implicit biases within ourselves. I travel quite a bit and um, I tend to hear this every single time I get on the flight. And I'm sure many of you do as well. Um, but however, during those instructions that are always given each flight, I tend to kind of doze off, get on my phone, not really pay attention. And I was wondering how many of us do this in everyday life? These are life-saving instructions. And although we hear it, how many of us could really apply it when the time is ready? Because we so many times just continue on about our day and ignore these vital instructions to secure our own mask before helping others. So as we dissect this, I want us to um, learn more and get more information about how to look into that, um, securing our own mask before helping others. For example, um, in everyday practices, how can we sit with our thoughts, sit with our discomfort, and understand that we're bringing a lot of our own biases to the table when we're supporting communities that are at risk. Let's see, I'm trying to... So the National Association of Professional and Peer Lactation Supporters of Color formed um, out of a mode of survival. Many times, so as we see in everyday settings, things are done for us without us. And what the common um, proverb says, um, things that are done for us without us are really not for us. So a group of us decided to really organize and show strength and support and really come together to strengthen our skills and our support level and cultivate a community that will transform um, policies and practices and skilled lactation care to decrease barriers and also increase awareness about uh, the skill sets and the things that are needed for communities of color to give to serve with cultural humility and to also support other professionals. Um, these are our board members currently, and Stacy our Stacy Davis is currently our executive director. She's not able to be with us today, but she's with us in spirit. And I believe um, Cami and Andrea, as well as Brenda, has also spoken on the webinars at some point. This is my family that really encourages me and are my whys. I like to think that um, my breastfeeding relationship kind of started in a form of um, resiliency. I was offered the shot 17 years ago now, 18 years ago now, to dry my milk up without any information about breastfeeding um, when I was about 35 weeks pregnant. And I did not understand why that happened um, when I, have grown to realize since then, being in the field of uh, maternal child health, that that was a result of systemic racism. If I hadn't asked what this shot is for, my OBGYN at the time would have just gladly given it to me and it would have dried, not only dried up my milk supply prematurely before giving birth, but also statistically that shot has now been rendered um, um, uh, not approved by the FDA. However, once I realized that this um, breast milk is best for my child, that's really all I needed to encourage me to at least try breastfeeding, I was discouraged by um, family members because of the um, trauma that's happened in our family where breastfeeding was not continued for generations. So this, of course, so, um, really give me the, gave me the fuel to attempt to breastfeed and I was able to breastfeed my three children that you see here and continue to help others breastfeed and it really transformed my career with those experiences and professional impact that it's made to want to help other families and other folks in this field um, recognize that I too and we all have probably been a victim of the system that has been set up generations before us. 
I want to take this time to sincere, give a sincere thanks to the Center for Social Inclusion um, formally. Um, it's now known as Face a race forward. Um, and Simran Noor, who was our instructor for the First Food Equity Cohort, that was a grant funded program where um, 16 individuals were selected nationally after applying to take part in an 18 month cohort to basically change the um, change and understand structural um, barriers and institutional barriers and systemic racism and have these tools that we'll present today to go forth and try to, to change the status quo and change policies and systems and practices and realizing it's much deeper than individual reflection. So I'm gonna take this three minutes now to really highlight my fellow cohort leaders um, and this program and why this, not only the series that USBC is doing is so imperative, but why the work that each and every one of you do is so important. And Miriam, would you mind uploading that YouTube video, please? You might need to unmute your line, Miriam. First food is, that. that is life. That is, that's the nourishment of life. We're talking about the foundation for our community's health, the first preventative act that we can do for our babies and for our mothers. African American infertility rates are amongst the highest two times those of white babies. We know breastfeeding is something that can address the vitality of an infant and bring about that first year of life and beyond. A generation ago, I didn't have that experience with my mother or with my grandmother. My mom's story, when she delivered me at the hospital, she was given pills to dry up her milk. So my first food was probably a carnation or a Nestle formula or something. Breastfeeding had always been something that was important to me because it's something that I saw my sister do. And this is from a family that really had stopped breastfeeding. When you immigrate to the United States, you want to take on American ways. It's uh, about reclaiming traditions. It's about self-determination. It's about building community. I began to see how people of color were were treated differently and how the resources were, were not going into communities when it comes to support during pregnancy and then support after having the baby. It's very important in regard not only to breastfeeding, but just health in general and health equity in general, that it's really important to have that racial equity lens. Moving away from disparities and diversity and really talking about inequities and structural racism. There are some times they, it's very good, they're very smart and stuff like that, but it doesn't get to the people that it should go. Like I see things more and it angers me more and makes me want to do more. I, mean, I, I think it's eventually that all the hospitals in general, the lactation field has been by white women for white women, and I, that doesn't work for communities of color. So I obviously want to see a field that is reflective of our country. At least 50% of the breastfeeding field should be people of color. That is where we'll really start to see changes in who's breastfeeding. I'm convinced that I'm doing this work for my great-grandmothers and all the elders in the community who was stripped of the opportunity to breastfeed and who didn't breastfeed. I'm doing it for the mamas and the babies. I'm doing it for my community, communities of color. I'm doing it for our next generation, our current generation. Like that's that's who this work is for. Okay, 
Thank you so much, Mary. So as we marinate on that powerful video, it is available on YouTube, but I do like to highlight my um, sister leaders in the field that is also doing this imperative work as well as so many others. And I'm very, very grateful for the opportunity to learn and to continue being a lifelong learner from those ladies. So before we start, because um, we do know that uh, anytime we talk about race, anytime we talk about inequities, sometimes this can bring forth a discomfort. So I like to start with just rules of engagement. I just ask that you all just stay engaged, um, experience the discomfort that may come up in this a part of the process and understand that we cannot grow from comfortable places. Expect and accept non-disclosure, non-closure, sorry, um, because we do know it's not going to be resolved in one webinar um, time frame in an hour. This is a life time generational work. I often say I my goal is to work myself out of a job so that my great 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 grandchildren would never have to talk about disparities and equities and maternal child health and and breastfeeding rates. Assume best intentions and ask clarifying questions. Again, um, this is going to come up later um, with our when we discuss biases and why that's important and instead of assuming um, Assuming what um, folks mean or what you may interpret it as, clarifying questions are imperative. Honor your own emotions. Every time I do a presentation um, about inequities or racial uh, um, disparities, I, I really have to take time out to honor my emotions. It is, a, it, you can ask anyone that speaks on um, racial inequities and cultural humility. It is very draining uh, work. Um, but it is our responsibility to continue to change it. And so with you all, I just encourage you to honor where you're at on your journey and continue to work, um, do the work and the heavy lifting that's gonna take to change some of these uh, statistics and biases that we see. Also listen for understanding. So many times we listen and we listen to respond. So listen, absorb, and let this marinate um, and take it back to your everyday practices to help change the system. So racial inequities, diversity, inclusion, um, sometimes we hear these words so much it can it could be very uh, illusion, you know, it can be lost. Um, just like those instructions that we hear on the airplane, like, oh my goodness, are we really talking about this again? So many times when I'm presenting, I'll hear groans or, oh, are we still talking about race? Or why do we keep having to revisit this subject? Um, and it kind of becomes dulled. And I wanted to present this because we do know that just like that mask that can save our lives, if there's an emergency in an airplane, these tools, these skills are imperative when it comes to um, practices and policies. And they also um, could be life-saving when it comes to communities of color. And we want to honor that. And we want to make sure that the, our, our, our um, understanding is deeper than individual, that it impacts systems, it impacts communication, it impacts board governance, it impacts funding even, it impacts evaluation, and um, how we respond to others and the service that we give to others. It always centers down to um, racial, dis racial disparities, inequities, um, and diversity. So we don't want it to get lost in a sauce for a sense. We want to honor this every time and pay close attention. And we want to try to make sure and ask ourselves, are we really practicing this every day in our practices? We do know that according to research that race is a predictor of how well you do in education, criminal justice, health, jobs, environment, housing, culture, and arts. Race is a, a, a determinant factor in that. I want to ask you all a question and feel free to respond in the question response or the chat box um, and we'll read some of your answers out loud. 
And I want you to be honest with yourself. Again, this is a shared opportunity for learning. When was the last time you thought about your race? Please use the chat or the question box to share your answers and we'll read those out. And I'll propose another question to you as well. When was the first time you thought about your race or the color of your skin? So um, we are seeing questions from a month ago, yesterday to always. It's something I'm constantly reminded of. Mm -hmm. Someone says in high school, someone says every 10 minutes. Mm. Yeah, yesterday in a conversation, but really all the time. Mm -hmm. uh, someone says maybe like in the third grade. Uh, one says when I was 16 years old. Um, Mm -hmm. I and want to see it all the time, um, every single day, constantly. Mm -hmm. When I first emigrated to the United States, I did not think about race before I did, was one of the answers. Powerful. Mm -hmm. And I would like for us to all to think about those answers um, and how it impacts our everyday life. Um, I can tell you from um, walking through this world as a Black woman, there's not a moment that goes by that I don't think about my race. However, um, I do realize I actually just had a conversation with a colleague um, who was white, and she said that, you know, she never thought about how she walks through the world. She never realized that when she gets pulled over um, that she's not going to get home anything other than safe. Um, and, and that's a drastic difference. And those that are around you, those white folks that might be listening to this call that may have people of color that they are close to or they feel comfortable asking, I want you to propose this question to them and ask yourself truthfully the same question. And I can guarantee you that people of color will instantly know <laughs> the answer to this, whereas sometimes it takes a minute for um, white folks to think about when was the first time that they thought about or had to think about the color of their skin or the way they walk through the world. Think about anything we fill out, just like this pertains to this slide and how um, it asks about race. That's the number one question. We have to honor that color exists. We can't go through this world colorblind because this impacts and race impacts how our babies live, how our babies eat, how our mothers die, and how we live. With that being said, I want everyone to understand that for terms of um, um, for purpose of this presentation, we are centered in a U.S. context, although we do know um, um, black is global, anti-black is global, the darker the skin. That's a global concept. We do know um, colonizers and colonization has happened to each country. Um, for purposes of this uh, presentation, we want to understand that race is a social construct, is not biologically determined, despite what many folks believe. Race is also an idea that um, is determined by, um, it, it changes what race is, as we know in the, in the history of the U.S. that has constantly changed. We do know policy drives social construct of race and how that contributes to race over time. And I want us all to make sure that we center in the fact that we did not choose this system. Um, but it's our responsibility to address it and do something about it, starting today, if you haven't started already. For communities of colors, race is and um, disproportionately uh, the determination of how our health is impacted. We do know that there's a difference in gaps that are driven by race. And even saying the word race, according to research done by CSI, if we hook ourselves up to an EKG, 
our heart rate immediately goes faster just by saying the word race. So that's how uncomfortable the tensions are when talking about it. But that's also why it's important that we continue to talk about it. Think about how you feel when others talk about race or when you talk about race. Um, just like I explained how I feel when I'm talking about race. Um, that in itself says a lot of how we've been impacted by the, all of us, not only people of color, have been impacted by the systems of race and understanding what to do with that. So we do know that racism can be explicit and implicit. Um, our government, for example, we have very explicit terms when discussing race in the history of our um, United States, where it was black folks had to sit on the back of the bus, um, the trail of tears, um, even as um, recent as uh, some legislative change in some states such as Alabama, where it's explicit. However, for the majority of the time with our policies and practices um, and our laws, it became implicit. Although many times folks look at laws and different institutions as a, a race neutral territory, we do know that um, that's not the case that it became implicit and it continues to perpetuate in which we see the system and the statistics that we see every day. Um, just recently, we do uh, realize even here in the state of Florida, for instance, um, those of you that are familiar with me, I've talked about it all the time. We just passed where our um, folks that were felons can now vote and just recent with no requirements and just recently, because of the implicit structures that are happening, they're trying to push that folks that were felons who were voted, who were um, by 65% voted, said that they can now be restored, are saying now that you have to pay a poll tax, for instance, or pay back your court fees in order to be able to vote. So this is an example of systemic racism and how it impacts, it's implicit, it doesn't say that, but we do know disproportionately what the prison system looks like and what that's going to look like with the voting changes. Um, so paying attention to that. A personal example, um, an individual example of how racism impacts is the medical treatment of Black women. Um, we do know that communities of colors are disproportionately treated differently when it comes to the system. Serena Williams, who is again, um, a brilliant athlete. She um, had her, her daughter recent, well, I guess her daughter's about a year old now, but she spoke out about how she was treated in the hospital. This is an athlete that is very familiar with her body, um, conditioned um, to pay close attention to every aspect that she's feeling in order to perform her optimum um, performance in tennis. While she was in the hospital, she was um, pained and she knew something wasn't right. So she requested her medical doctors, give her, a C her, her nurse and her medical doctors, give her a CT scan with contrast and a heparin drip because she knew her history of blood clots. However, she was not listened to. The nurse mistook her um, complaints and her pain as um, just her being delusional due to her pain. The nurse then um, put in a, a ultrasound order um, and Serena Williams became very upset because she said, I do not need an ultrasound. I need a CT scan with contrast and a heparin drip. The ultrasound as suspected showed up nothing. And then it was then that the doctors listened to her and she was given the uh, CT can scan, which showed blood clots in her lungs that were settled and which she received a heparin drip. Now, imagine if we didn't have but seconds, as we do know, um, with the maternal morbidity rates, that this could have turned out very differently. And this is a celebrity. This is a, a billionaire. Um, and it all boils down to biases and medical treatment of Black women. Another example, is Keisha Knight Pullum. She is a child star and an actress of The Cosby Show. And her experience with delivering her child, again, another celebrity, 
she stated that she was only given options by her lactation provider for WIC programs and that it was assumed that she didn't have insurance. And she also stated that the lactation provider um, acted as if she didn't want to touch her or be close to her and her baby. And she definitely felt like that her the color of her skin was the drive of that. Keisha also went on to explain that she has no problems with WIC. She thinks it's a great program. However, if this option was given to her in a list of community resources and other um, opportunities available for support, she wouldn't have been so offended. But again, um, because of biases that were experienced or acted upon by the lactation provider, um, Keisha was plain and simple discriminated against. And these are celebrities, and these are folks that have privileges and that have insurance. Think about how folks of color walk through this world um, in medical facilities and, and private practices in the grocery store, in the mall, and how they are treated. And they don't even have the privileges or the statuses as these two celebrities. So again, this happens all the time. And these are just two stories to highlight um, because of their fame. And we want to be careful that we are not the providers that are being implicit and acting upon it and discriminated against people of color, specifically Black women, because we do know the statistics. Um, and we'll discuss more of the statistics when it comes to maternal morbidity and infant mortality. So here's an example of how racial disparity um, and inequities show up. Recently, there was articles um, that I read um, and discovered that showed a segregation in the NICU or, or, or a lack of care for uh, Black babies when it comes to um, inequities, how um, treatment was given and the facilities they had access to. And you can look that up. Um, here, and I will also provide the link um, at the end of the webinar for resources on the website. Also, we do know the reality that the CDC highlighted as well is that the access to human milk and human donor milk specifically in NICUs to Black babies are far less and there's a disparity there. These are clinically and statistically um, significant racial and ethnic disparities between NICUs. Um, and the racial inequity disparity and the segregation comes from the Stanford University School of Medicine in a very large quantitative study. This long history of disparities in healthcare and how healthcare is delivered shows that NICUs are no different than what we already know about Black folks and people of color and how they're treated by the medical community. We want to point out that this also takes place in organizations. And we need to reflect on how do we reduce this? How do we reduce this from happening? How, what is our responsibility in making sure that um, we're doing our part in changing the systems and the policy of practices to not have these happen and to um, change the results of how we're treating communities of color and, and medical facilities? In this specific instances, um, it was highlighted that zip codes or hospitals of Black residents um, were the highest, did not have access, or were not given access to human donor milk. As we know that babies, um, as the Boston Public Health Commission tells us, that babies born to Black women with a college degree are more likely to die the first year of life than babies born to white women that did not finish high school. So, so many times folks say, oh, well, it's not a race issue. Oh, it's not about class. It's a class issue. Oh, no, it's an education issue. No, we got to name it. We got to call it what it is and call it out. And that's the only way we're going to change and challenge the system and take responsibility for it and say it boils down to race. And again, time and time again, not only individually, but systemically and research shows that this um, in, in, is the facts. Let's take a look at um, breastfeeding rates. There is a huge disproportion when it comes to um, Black infants that are um, breastfed. And again, although the rates are increasing in Black infants that are breastfed, or, um, the gap is widening for the first time. And that's very scary to think about, that for the first time ever, 
uh, the gap is widening. So what does that tell us? Yeah, we're doing great. We're doing better in the, in the U.S. in terms of promoting breastfeeding, but we're not doing a good job supporting. Because if we were doing good a job supporting, every single rate that we see with Black, White, Asian, um, Native would all be the same. So we do know those inequities are statistically because of some of the stories and the reasons we are discussing. Recent research also said that Black mothers were nine times more likely to be given formula in hospitals, which accounts alone for 20%. And that's absolutely disheartening when it comes to duration of Black and white mothers um, in the hospital. Um, and I can tell you by day two, Black mothers were more than likely to receive or offer a formula than white mothers. From my work done with CHAMPS and what they just uh, published um, recently was that the huge uh, changes when it comes to this implementing the Step 10 baby-friendly accreditation support that they're doing out in Mississippi, that when they when they um, recorded the statistics previously, that there was a huge gap when um, given skin to skin or access to, um, to breast milk, mother's own milk. However, when these policies and practices were clear and guided, when the 10 steps were implemented, the racial disparities um, almost were obsolete. And that is why it's so vital to have um, practices and policies that have a racial equity lens, because this in itself could really change the demographics of breastfeeding and health outcomes. So we do know that African Americans are 2.2 more likely to um, have infant mortality rate than um, non-Hispanic whites. African Americans are 3.2 likely to die from complications such as birth weight compared to non-Hispanic whites. Again, talking about the research that we just discussed um, in reference to the segregation that takes place can attribute to that. African Americans also had over twice the sudden death um, syndrome mortality rate than non-whites in 2014. And also African-American mothers were 2.2 more likely to receive late or no prenatal care. Let's break it down to um, colors of skin because we do know that all communities of colors are impacted by um, racism and poor care. And statistically, we can see that in different health outcomes, not only infant and breastfeeding, but heart disease, uh, such as African-Americans um, and um, un undocumented um, um, immigrants. So as we can see here, immigrants with lightest to lightest complexions earn about eight to 15% more than to those with darkest complexion. And we also know that one shade has uh, about the same effect as an additional year of education. So think about this. And I want, I want to challenge folks, um, our communities of colors too, Black folks and all communities of color, thinking about this when we're talking about in terms of internal racism and all, and we do know it exists. We don't always talk about it and how that impacts um, statistics as well. And thinking about this in terms of systemically how this talks about or can impact the wealth gap that we all know that's there and the wage gap that takes place. And we're not even talking about, we're not even breaking it down gender wise. We do know disproportionately that exists as well. So let's dig deep into biases. When we talk about biases, Typically, when we're acting upon them, the unconscious bias, um, by definition, we're going to um, use the definition of the Center for Social Inclusion. Unconscious bias is uh, automatic mental shortcuts used to process information to make quick decisions. So such as we're driving down the road, 
what our immediate response will be, such as we associate stove or fire with hot. So these unconscious biases, we take, pl take place and we don't even recall or we might not even understand why. But however, we all carry them. Everyone is susceptible to them. It's how we walk through the world, what we've experienced in our walk. We all carry biases, but we do know that acting upon biases can lead to dis discrimination and it can create negative outcomes that are disproportionately for particular groups and targeted groups. So paying attention to that is important and acknowledging that and being truthful with yourself is uh, vital. Biases can come in terms of explicit and implicit, as we gave the example with uh, laws that from our country previously. Explicit laws would be like Black folks can't drink from this water fountain or Black folks can't use this um, bathroom, um, for instance. Implicit would be Jim Crow laws. Implicit would be um, biases that took place that may take place in every day, such as a number of police pulled over as uh, um, when it comes to demographics or uh, disproportionately um, folks killed by uh, police and the protocols that take place. Those biases when acted upon is discrimination. We have to be aware of biases. Um, and um, when we're aware of them explicitly, and we also think of this as like individual racism or whatnot, when folks may have um, um, or call someone racist or have an experience with explicitly being uh, said, oh, I explicit example would be like, oh, I just like whites more than I like Latinos. Um, an implicit example of that would be um, someone that might walk into a room and sit further away from Latinos, closer to whites. So implicitly, they might not even realize that they're doing that. But explicitly, if it was someone that was verbalizing that, um, that they prefer whites, we will understand why. So when acting upon what the implicit bias and, and even the explicit bias, of course, given, um, that could be racist and determined as um, how we see and how, we, how, we, how statistics and differences prevail. So another example would be like, we don't rent to whatever, um, explicit background choice. Um, another example would be more criminal backgrounds done on African-Americans. Uh, I do know that many people are familiar with like resumes or names on resumes example, the, the, an extensive research that's done time and time again and proven that folks can have the same exact resume. One resume can have um, ethnic sounding name, one can have a, a, a dominant culture sounding name, and the ethnic sounding name will be called back less or not get the job or the opportunity more than a dominant sounding name, despite the same exact um, work history, education, and experiences. So most people are overwhelmingly not aware of their unconscious bias, and that is the problem. Again, just like when we're sitting in that airplane listening to the instructions, we could, we don't even realize when they say secure your own mask. We don't even realize when they give us uh, the directions of the exits. We just sit there and unconsciously are not aware of it. And those are biases, um, just like the biases that we can exhibit when we're practicing and helping our communities of color. Another example of implicit bias, for instance, in the 80s, the orchestra was very interested in increasing um, uh, female musicians, women musician, musicians, and they were trying really hard to, in, in campaigning and marketing, to get more women to audition for the orchestra. However, someone thought to, um, what about we put a screen in between the person performing and the interviewer and try that way? And so when they implemented this and they put that screen between the interview and a the musician, they hired 25 to 46 more women in the orchestra, astronomical. So what they did a step further was that they were wondering if the sound of the shoe was impacted by the decision-making of the interviewer. 
So this time what they did was they still had the screen up. However, they brought the um, interviewer in um, last and put the audition, the, the person auditioning in first so, how, so they could not hear the person coming in. And when they did that alone, they increased that same number by 10%. So we do know that although they, the interviewers, I can imagine, they were trying hard, they wanted women musicians and to see more of them in orchestra. They, uh, they were being biased and they acted upon their biases. And this is a big example of it, just like the hiring. So how do we change this? What do we do? How do we secure our own mass? What we have to do is change in biases, is more importantly, change in attitudes, change in behavior, and it's continuing. We need to change our mind frame and follow that up with our behavioral change and being conscious of that. And it requires long-term and short-term approaches. Change in biases, it needs to be intentional. We need to have the motivation to change. We need to pay attention to um, stereotypical responses or how we assume things. And we need time to practice these new strategies and implement them. And I will use myself, for example, you know, so many biases that um, put into play, for instance, um, what the example I always give as a, as a clinician is when um, I first came to the hospital, which I never heard this term in the community and those that might be in clinical and why it probably attributes to um, racism that takes place is when we hear um, that black babies often do better um, that are born prematurely than white babies. And what that assumption's done, what are we doing or what was I doing? I had to ask myself when I, when my nurses called me in and stated, oh, Felicia, I have a 36 week um, white baby um, boy. Or how I'll respond to, oh, Felicia, I have a 36 week black baby girl. How would I respond to that differently? Okay, you know, typically what my stereotypical thinking and ways of what I was thinking or what I acknowledged I did or um, and had to pay close attention to and how we all have to ask ourselves and sit in discomfort and acknowledge that. Would I, was I given that 36 week or black baby girl the same keen skill assessment that I was given that 36 week or black um, white baby boy? Not sure, but I had to be aware that those like the stereotypes or the status quo or the things that were said or um, um, the systemic mistreatment that happens can um, be a habit that, that sits in healthcare professionals and can really determine outcomes. So ask yourself, what are those things that I stereotypically respond to um, and may approach knowing um, that this might be a habit that can cause an inequity and an outcome? We have to change individual biases. We have to surface our own assumptions, just like the example I gave you being vulnerable. Um, we have to check our own biases. We have to really commit to equity, not just on paper, not just for grants, not just disparity pent, these grants that many organizations are doing. We need to commit to it in our practices and our trainings and digging deep, joining groups, doing more, addressing it in our private safe settings of folks that look like us. Start where communities of colors are by doing better. We have to also build trust. So many times folks say, um, white white clinicians will come up to me like, no matter what I do, I can't get black women to come to my support group. Why is that? Really? You know, we have to address those biases and those tensions. First, we have to build trust. We have to start with the community priorities. We have to engage in a resource and care about not just that woman's brown breast, but care about how she's gonna pay her rent. We need to care about um, the stressors that take place and that takes place on people of color walking through this world every day. We need to engage and um, really have a strong influence of our institutions and our organizations and take this back and demand um, that these policies are structured in a way that is um, centering racial equity. With different kinds of racism, most oftentimes when we use the term race, we also think of it of an individual standpoint, um, but we do know that institutional racism and the policies and practices that happen um, to discriminate 
often benefit white folks um, unintentionally or inadvertently. Structural racism is the history and the institution of racism that operates together when these systems are combined. And again, all of these kind of work as a well-oiled wheel as we think of that when we combine the three, then we, we, this is the problem and this is the um, system that we inherit and that we have to take a responsibility and to dismantle and our approach. So instead of taking things personally, or when I say, or folks might say, oh, you benefit from white privilege. Well, well, I grew up poor. I don't benefit away. I had to work hard. I had to pull myself up by the bootstrap, blah, blah, blah. However, you may walk through this world white and you might not have unconsciously realized that you benefit from the system and the structures and the, um, the laws that were made to benefit folks that look like you you do have to acknowledge that the systems that are in place definitely perpetuate racism if we think about how the system was created and how it impacts negative communities of color as we say all the time in breastfeeding facts are not attacks and these are the facts and you have to swallow that pill and determine what am i going to do about this okay i am uncomfortable in this this is discomfort i, I understand um that i am i although I, I, I um, feel like I am not a benefit of the system, I do participate in it. And what can I do to make sure that these inequities do not take place? So a tool that I encourage folks to look at and that I love and I even have to use is um, a tool that is created by Center for Social Inclusion that's research-based called the ACT tool, Affirm, Counter, and Transform. You will also have this link um, to look at that and examine that. Um, those counseling skills of how we're framing the conversations about race. Many times um, folks, especially white people, come to me, well, how do I have a conversation about race at the dinner table? That's so uncomfortable or with um, folks that are my colleagues that are talking about it because they're comfortable about discussing um, racism or being racist. How do I address it without being confrontational or without feeling like um, I'm going to be uh, ostracized? I can't promise you won't be ostracized because like we said, talking about race is always an, uh, create attention and can be uncomfortable. But we can give you tools and use this tool as a bridge to create those conversations and, and start normalizing the conversation to have that impact to remove the barrier and ideally change the system. <laughs>